Well, hello everybody and welcome to our second ever Facebook Live live stream. Um, my thank you so much for tuning in with us here today. We have another fantastic discussion for you all to, to be a part of. Now before we begin, um, if this is your first time tuning in or if this is your second time tuning in, but you just need a little bit of a refresher on how this whole thing is going to work. Um, we have a fantastic Facebook moderator who will be in the chat with you all in the comment section answering what questions they're able to and then directing some of those to me as well as my esteemed guests who we will meet in just a second. Um, if you do have any questions or comments, please do put those in the, in the chat below and we'll be sure to try to get to those if possible um, in the time a lot of that we have here and we will hopefully get to those as much as possible. But other than that, just sit back and enjoy what's going to be a great discussion. Now, before we go any further, I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself. As you can see in my name card below, my name is Aaron Provencio, and I am a member of the communications team here at Galapagos Conservancy. And I am joined today by a fantastic guest. Roz, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Hi. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm actually sitting in Galapagos right now, so officially greetings from Galapagos. Uh, I technically am the Galapagos liaison because there's no real way to describe what I do, but for the for the topic today, I, I guess it's as important to mention that I've been uh, I've been living in Galapagos for 30 years, and through uh, both when I first came here. It was a very different Galapagos 30 years ago, and most of the people that I knew, and particularly as an English teacher, the parents, the kids, whatever else, were from a lot of the settler families. And then as I moved into conservation work, uh, it became very, very clear that my public speaking invariably started with, we're mostly cleaning up the effects of human activity in past centuries. So... That's kind of where I fit into the picture today. I love these islands. I love the people who live here. I'm fascinated by the stories. And of course, having worked now for conservation for over 20 years, it's fascinating to see how it all fits together. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me today, Roz, <laughs> and joining all of us who are here viewing together. Um, as Roz mentioned, she is in fact down in Galapagos, which one of the double-edged swords of, of living in a place as beautiful and remote as the Galapagos Archipelago is that the internet can get a little spotty. So if you were trying to get away from folks, it's a fantastic place to, to visit for that. But that does also mean that every so often we do and can potentially have internet trouble. So although Roz's connection is crystal clear right now, we might be experiencing some problems later on. So just in case that happens, I wanted you to give a heads up um, ahead of time. Now, uh, as I should mention, um, we are here for a very special reason today, which is that this past Wednesday um, was the 43rd anniversary of the Galapagos Archipelago's designation as a World Heritage Site by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Um, and that, which will be referred to as UNESCO um, moving forward. And if you have been paying attention to our social media, our Instagram and Facebook this week, you will kind of be ahead of the game because there are certain criteria, 10 actually, that allow a site itself, like the Galapagos Archipelago, to be designated as an UNESCO heritage site. And in the case of Galapagos, there are four. And so we're going to very quickly go through those before we get into the meat of all of this discussion. Um, criteria seven is to contain superlative natural phenomena or areas of exceptional natural beauty and aesthetic importance. So let me see if I can go ahead and transition. If you were watching our um, live stream this week, you probably saw this picture right here, which is, of course, Kicker Rock. Now, Kicker Rock is a fantastic example of the many um, natural spots of beauty and aesthetic importance within Galapagos. I think that Roz herself could, exp um, could attest to this and anybody else who's had the privilege to visit the archipelago, that it is a place of incredible natural beauty, which is, of course, one of the reasons that UNESCO designated it as a World Heritage Site. 
Um, criteria eight, the next one of those four is to be an outstanding example representing major stages of Earth's history, including the record of life, significant ongoing geological processes and the development of landforms, or significant geomorphic or physiographic features. Now, as you probably all know, and especially if you, if you have been around Galapagos Conservancy and our work for a while, um, the Galapagos Archipelago is, in fact, a um, group of islands of volcanic origin with a history of between three and five million years. This island, this chain of islands, this archipelago is a fantastic example of the ongoing geological processes that build our planet and the many landforms on it. Criteria nine next up is to be outstanding examples representing significant or ongoing ecological and biological processes in the evolution and development of terrestrial, freshwater, coastal, and marine ecosystems and communities of plants and animals. This one might be the easiest to explain, so I don't know if I'm going to waste um, all of your time sitting here talking about this, but as you know, as we know, Galapagos was a place of incredible and unique biodiversity, a place where um, evolution has, has used its paintbrush to craft an incredible masterpiece of, of wildlife, plants, animals, and, uh, and, a, and an array of, of living creatures that are like nowhere else on the planet. And then, of course, criteria 10, to contain the most important and significant natural habitats for in situ conservation of biological diversity, including those containing threatened species of outstanding universal value from the point of view of science or conservation. And, and that one right there, criteria 10, is kind of why we're here. That's why there is so much conservation effort that goes into Galapagos, because as I mentioned before, the unique biodiversity of the Galapagos archipelago is incredibly unique and endemic and fragile. And the unique and necessary habitats that exist for these different wildlife on Galapagos need our help. And that is kind of what we're here to talk about today is, is how did we get here? How did we get to a point where this intense conservation action by us, by our collaborators, and by the Ecuadorian government um, is so important? But what a lot of people may not know is that Galapagos, outside of the incredible ecological presence that is there, also has a really unique human heritage as well. And it's one that is interconnected with the island's ecology itself, and as well as some of its most difficult and present problems. So that is why we have Roz here today, is because as she said herself, she is um, a longtime resident of Galapagos. She is our quote unquote Galapagos liaison, who is kind of our eyes and ears on the ground in Galapagos outside of um, some of our other research partners, scientists and things like that. And she is also a published author of this book right here, uh, Galapagos Revealed, which I got a copy of when I first started working here at GC. And if you want a copy for yourself um, at the end of this presentation, feel free to visit the store at galapagos.org to, to snag yourself a copy before it's too late, because after this presentation and this discussion with Roz, those might be flying off the shelves. So definitely get ahead of that. And before we get into it, one more thing I should mention is that we are in the middle of our September membership appeal, which is we have a lot of projects going on, a lot of upcoming expeditions, and we need your support to be able to make these things happen, to be able to supply our scientists and rangers and researchers with the equipment and know-how that they need to help preserve these ecosystems that we've been talking about. So if you want to go to the link in the comment section below that is pinned, um, you'll be able to donate at any point during this live stream if you so choose. And we definitely would appreciate that because we absolutely need your help. Now, whew, I'm sure you all are very tired of, of hearing me drone on about all of this. So we're going to go ahead and hand it over to Roz. So Roz, let's, let's start from the beginning. How and when did humans first come to shore in the Galapagos Archipelago? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's, it really speaks to all the sorts of global things that were happening uh, that put, literally put Galapagos on the map is um, 500 years ago sounds like forever ago. Maybe it was. Uh, but that was really a time of colonization, of exploration. I mean, literally, including countries like Australia, where I'm from, were, were not even on the map. And so... 
what happened was uh, a very famous, the Bishop of Panama at the time for Spain, Thomas de Belanga, is uh, accidentally floated over here when the boat that he was on became stalled, no wind, uh, and the strong currents from mainland Ecuador to Galapagos pulled them across to the islands here. And so it was the first time Galapagos had actually been identified as existing was back in 1535. So, of course, he reported that back to the King of Spain and um, not just Spain, but in South America, of course, the gold was very attractive. The Incan um, artifacts, everything else had really uh, targeted South America as the place to go to plunder, to capture in the name of the major royal houses at the time and also to carry all that gold away. So Thomas of Alunga, completely by accident, was probably very grateful to see land, but was the first person to report that this place existed and technically put it on a map. And then not long after, come forward about 100 years, in the six, 1600s, particularly the late 1600s, there was a lot of voyaging going on. And one man in particular, um, William Dampier, who also travelled as far as Australia, he's in our history as well, he wrote a book after his um, big world trip called a, a, a New Voyage Around the World. And that triggered quite a lot of uh, explorers and sailors into action. And because Galapagos was now existed, that also brought people out around here. So we're going back four or 500 years in those golden ages of major usual royal houses sending their people out to explore countries claiming new, new lands, the new world for themselves. And Galapagos got onto that map. Um, also, you know, who doesn't love a pirate story? Uh, the pirates were very active and the legal ones and the pirate ones like, you know, Black Bart, good old Bartholomew Roberts is, uh, is known to have been operating in the vicinity. Again, not just what the riches of the lands offered, but this was a major um, route for a lot of uh, cargo, transport, trading of, I don't know, spices from one side for gold for the other. So there was a lot of great stuff to steal. <laughs> and Galapagos was a very strategic point to do that from. And so uh, we have relics of um, evidence of pirates, physical evidence of some caves on Floriana that were used by the pirates uh, when they were coming here to get their food and water. Uh, but it also... The privateers, you know, you can make anything look good if you make it by royal decree. And so pirates by another name were called privateers. And they were also plundering and exploring uh, in the name. So we've got explorers, we've got lost priests, and we've got pirates to start the story off that put Galapagos literally on the map. I think that is such a unique aspect of the the settlement of Galapagos by humans, but this whole concept of this lost priest, there's a lot of evidence that shows <laughs> that a lot of these animals that ended up on Galapagos that have relations to mainland Central and South America also ended up on, you know, rafts of a sort, uh, bundles of sticks or a tree trunk or something like that that happened to catch the right current and end up washing up on the shores of Galapagos just like uh, just like that priest oh. himself. And I should, Roz, as you mentioned, Galapagos was a place of, of intense strategic importance, as well as a place for sailors, for pirates, for privateers, um, for lost priests to stop over and spend some time. And they weren't necessarily looking to settle Galapagos, or at least not yet. They were more trying to utilize certain resources that allowed them to survive or or at least pass through the Pacific Ocean more successfully. What were those resources? You know, it's, it's very true. Nobody thought of Galapagos really as much more than, I call it the supermarket of the Pacific, where they could get fresh water. If you knew where to look, there is uh, sources of fresh water here. Um, get off the boat, you've probably been on for the last few years but also um, food, you know, birds, tortoises, whatever else. But probably the, the next biggest, and it wasn't a settlement attempt, 
uh, but certainly the biggest influence on um, conservation, modern day conservation, occurred in the late 1700s to the early 1800s when the US whaling fleet uh, began actively uh, capturing whales in and around Galapagos, which of course is, is on the, uh, the trajectory that the whales travel from their, uh, where they breed to where, they, to where they eat and that whole circle back again, they all come through Galapagos. So it was, it was almost literally cash, catching fish in a, in a fish bowl um, because all the whales were congregating in and around Galapagos. Ironically, it's some of those incredible records that those uh, boats kept, um, not just as the whales, but also the inventory of the tortoises they were collecting as food. So decimating the whale population was one thing, but the slow-moving tortoise, um, has we know it can survive even floating, but can survive extended periods of time without food and water. And so hundreds of thousands of tortoises over that period were collected and stacked on top of each other in the holds of these boats so they had fresh meat. Um, I would have done the same thing. I'm a pirate out in the middle of nowhere and I can get some fresh meat. I'd be pulling up and collecting tortoises on Galapagos as well. So it was it was literally going to the store to get the food. So that whaling industry was the first major impact on a Galapagos animal, which in this case, for the most part, was the Galapagos tortoises. Um, so what a lot of people don't know is uh, we probably have all heard the story of Moby Dick but Moby Dick is by by uh, Herman Melville is actually based on his time in on a whaling ship in and around Galapagos. And for those who want to follow up later, there's there's an, a, an incredible incredible series of stories called the Encantadas that Melville wrote about. The other name for Galapagos is the Enchanted Islands, the Encantadas. So he wrote, I think it's a, a ten piece story on his experience in Galapagos. So. By that time, I'm talking about written reports, books being written, all this type of thing. We, we'd also evolved as a species, we humans, uh, to where people were reading and writing and books were more common and et cetera. So uh, it was a very interesting time globally. And the main reason they were down here for the whales was not for the meat, it was for the oil. And so the luxuries that we take for granted today were thanks to basically the death of all those whales because that's what literally fueled the industrial revolution. All those machines need oil, the lights, the lamps, everything else, and whales were the best source of that. I, I think that this is an important moment to stop and talk about what I think the, the framing of this discussion was that when Roz and I were planning what this conversation was going to be, and it's that this conservation ethic that so many scientists and researchers and general members of the public have now is a relatively modern concept, at least in terms of Western civilization. And when, you know, in the, in the time when pirates and privateers were, were, and whalers were moving down and through the Galapagos, this was hundreds of years ago at a time when a lot of people still believed that there was an endless abundance of wild animals on the planet for use by human beings. There was no preservation or even environmental ethic to speak of in a lot of contemporary society. And so, as, you, as Roz keeps saying, this, um, this supermarket of the sea, this grocery store of the sea, was a place with zero historical interaction with humans that we really know of, and also very little terrestrial predation. So a lot of these animals on Galapagos didn't have a natural fear of humans, which meant that if you were a hungry, thirsty pirate and you had just spent months at sea and you get to, um, you land on the coast of Fernanda or something, one of the, one of the islands itself, um, and you see a big animal walking around who does not seem to be scared of you, you might think that's going to be a pretty easy meal. And unfortunately, it was. So that leads into our next question, which is when it comes to the whaling, when it comes to the resource use and the, the hunting of the different species early in human presence on Galapagos, what are the lasting ramifications from those early visitors to Galapagos? Probably 
probably the most impactful was removing what today we know is a keystone piece at species, which is the giant tortoises. The, they are habitat modifiers. They're the engineers of the ecosystem. They're, they're, the, they're the big herbivore here. They're our elephants here. Um, and so they are, they are such an integral part of all the plants and animals on a particular island in some way are dependent on these great big lumbering tortoises to spread seeds, to open pathways, um, to keep down certain types of plants. Uh, we're seeing that right now on uh, Little Island of Española. Without the presence of tortoises, shrubbery has grown up and that's making it difficult for the albatross to land. So the tortoises, the loss of the tortoises from Galapagos in big enough numbers that in many cases they weren't able to even reproduce, the numbers have been reduced so low, uh, the biggest impact is on literally every other plant and animal in Galapagos in some way depended on those tortoises. And so I would say that is probably the biggest legacy we're dealing with because there's a whole cascade of uh, impacts that flow on from the absence of tortoises that if you take them all separately, you've got a million little impacts on certain birds or certain plants. But the real missing link is the tortoise in the middle of all that. It's that old saying, death by a thousand paper cuts. Um, if, if those of you who are watching right now tuned into our last live stream, our first live stream like this with Dr. James Gibbs, uh, we're talking about this, this concept for the entire time is that tortoises in this ecosystem, our ecosystem engineers are the driving forces that manage so many little aspects of a functional, healthy Galapagos ecosystem. And so as Roz was saying, the loss of that keystone species, that, that necessary species was decimating to these ecosystems. And, and as we will continue to discuss, those echoes from the human actions hundreds of years ago are still absolutely shaping the conservation work that we are doing today. Now, Roz, let's fast forward just a little bit. From the Pirates and Privateers, when did people begin to make a concerted effort to settle Galapagos Archipelago, and, and how did that go? You know, right up until 1832, so we've skipped ahead a couple hundred years here, um, nobody really owned Galapagos. No country had officially claimed it or the archipelago as their own. And so, uh, again, thank you to people who kept records in those days. Uh, there was a lot of uh, military, US Navy, uh, during the war, the trade war with the United Kingdom were pretty much based out of uh, Galapagos. And what we call Post Office Bay, many of us have visited, visited or heard about it, and we certainly use it to promote it in our materials now, was actually where the US Navy used to raid the letters in there to find out what other boats were in the area, who were they going to chase, who were, they, you know, what was it going to be profitable, um, and strategic, strategic, uh, knowing strategically which of the UK boats, the English boats are actually there. So it wasn't, it was more heavily visited at the beginning of the 1800s, simply because, again, it's a strategic position and there was all these various wars and things going on. But in 1832, Ecuador uh, did, oh, before I go on to that, another big impact from that is the first registration of somebody leaving goats on the islands goes back to that time of that war. So 1812, 1813, around there, is the first documentation of instead of taking tortoises away in the thousands, which they'd already done, they started leaving things like goats, which are great food, you know, milk, leather, meat, they can survive anywhere. And so that change was also happening. The second level of degradation of, of Galapagos started happening around about then. So then we skip forward 20 years to 1832 and Ecuador has claimed Galapagos Archipelago as part of um, Ecuadorian sovereignty, sovereignty tree, anyway, for Ecuador. Uh, and again, goats come into the picture here. If goats can survive, humans can survive. 
And so uh, originally, Galapagos was really considered a, a suitable place to put the prisoners that they didn't want on the mainland. And so even back in that very early, early start in, in 1832, it was seen as, as a penal colony. And so uh, most of us have heard about the penal con colony on Isabella, but 100 years before that one on Floriana and um, San Cristobal was there. So there was tentatively a settlement because you needed the soldiers who probably did something really bad on the mainland to be sent to look after the prisoners on Isabella, uh, on, uh, on Galapagos. Uh, and so technically it was a settlement, but it wasn't in the name of Ecuador. So Ecuador started physically using the land from 1832. So it was 50 years later, more or less, when again, not technically a settlement, but certainly permanent presence in the islands. Uh, the most famous of those is a man called Manuel Cobos, who, um, you know, is a whole other 40 minute chat to talk about Manuel Cobos, but he on San Cristobal, he found where the water sources were, the fresh water. And so he pretty much had an, all the land he wanted to grow sugar. So he provided a lot of sugar to the mainland and he later became more known for um, setting up a big coffee empire there, which all these years later, you know, over a hundred years later, those plants are still there. Somebody else owns it, but that same coffee is still producing on, on San Cristobal. And so very turbulent part of the Ecuadorian presence in, in Galapagos. And again, only the toughest and probably most unwanted under very, very difficult conditions were actually living in Galapagos, fishing, working for Cobos, or probably military or Navy who were dealing with the penal colonies. Um, and also because it now belonged to Ecuador, you needed to have that Navy presence here because it, we now owned it, defended it so to speak. So yeah, that takes us up until kind of like the end of the 1800s. And again, just to re-emphasize, there still is not in any major part any sort of conservation or environmental ethic. The actions that were being taken on Galapagos, and correct me if I'm wrong, Roz, were being done for the sake of human safety, comfort, and continued presence with a disregard for ecosystem processes, wildlife safety, general environmental considerations that simply didn't exist until as we, as we're going to get to a much more recent time. Um, Roz, you, you kind of Did, touched, please. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add one more thing because Cobos was involved in this as well. Um, the, uh, we talked about the whales. And so by the mid 1800s, petroleum had pretty much replaced whale oil, that's why whaling pretty much stopped here. But the tortoise oil became just as important. And so one of the exports from Galapagos in that time was not the pirates car carrying away live tortoises as food, it was mass slaughter of whatever they could find for the oil. And there's a, there's a famous saying here that all the streetlights of Guayaquil at that time, uh, a major city on the mainland, uh, were lit by the tortoise oil from Galapagos. So the second wave of impact on the tortoises, as we mentioned, are a keystone species. Without them, everything else starts to go out of balance and fall apart. Also happened 100 years later, but this time for their oil, not as a food. Again, just really fascinating, interesting stuff. And we are getting more into the quote unquote modern era, but still not modern necessarily in terms of us and not modern in terms of Galapagos or conservation in any way. So the next, I guess, wave of settlements, and you kind of already talked about the strategic placement of um, Galapagos in the Pacific Ocean, but can you speak a little bit more on the military presence that has been historically on Galapagos in the past? Um, yeah, it's simply because of its, its very strategic position to patrol and monitor any action that's going on in the Pacific. Now, remember, when most of this was going on, the Panama Canal didn't exist. So to have a post 
where you can hide and work from and even, you know, feed yourself from is why Galapagos was so attractive. And that's actually also the reason why in the in the Second World War, um, Baltra uh, became a U.S. military post. Again, another big fabulous story there. There's been some great books written about the Baltra military post. But basically the U.S. Um, would bring supplies and things from Panama and maintain the outpost. And this this is a, this is a flat rock island that's probably only six miles wide, something like that. There's, there's nothing there, well, much to, <laughs> to speak of. But at one point, there was something like seven, six, seven thousand soldiers on that island and airstrips and planes coming in and out and just like a crazy amount of activity because it was one of uh, between Panama and Galapagos were how the US patrolled the whole Pacific region. Um, and uh, I kind of ironically, I had somebody here who who visited a couple of years ago who was testing to see the levels of fallout from the different world wars and how they were still circulating and spreading around the world and where the impact might be from from all the bombs and things we let off generations ago. And it was scary but fascinating to think that the atomic testing was the two places that they were planning to do it was Galapagos and the Bikini Atoll. But Ecuador had already declared a bit of a National Park Marine Reserve in the 1930s. They'd already started to put Galapagos on the map and there was a lot of uh, usually wealthy people who had the ability to bring their boats down doing research here um, in, in the 30s. And so Galapagos has already been put on the map a little bit as somewhere special with unusual things. Let's not blow it up with atomic bombs. So poor old Bikini Atoll got that great honour. Um, but because, <laughs> because of the position where Galapagos is situated and all the other things that it offered, it has always made it a very strategic place for 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 war games. And following, or I guess in line with those war games, eventually Galapagos just became a place that was interesting to settle, or at least being advertised to other members of the global community as a place to settle. Um, what sort of early settlement was there? What what were these people doing? in terms of industry, in terms of making money, in terms of, of exporting goods from the islands? And, and where did they come from in the first place? Uh, interestingly enough, Galapagos has always been, and the, the Ecuadorian government, has always been very open to international as well as national settlement. And so, of course, there is uh, Ecuadorian families, Ecuadorian fishing organizations, et cetera, that have, that have been, go back a century. Um, again, couldn't really call them settlements per se, but the real establishment, certainly on, um, on uh, Santa Cruz Island, where I am, was predominantly Norwegians. And this is this whole weird thing that went on globally. Like, like I mentioned at the beginning, what affects Galapagos is what's going on in the global politics and economy always. We, 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 we kind of get the filter down effects from that. And so we're between wars. There's and, and that's just the two big world wars as well as everything else we get up to as human beings. But there was a, you know, there's a, a level of recovery and poverty associated with any major war. Europe was facing all kinds of things. And so in order to continue to colonize, to settle uh, Galapagos as an Ecuadorian province, not just a place we went and take stuff from, but to actually settle it. They they did actually advertise in Europe, and so the most the most known and well documented was a migration of over 200 Norwegian people who came down here to set up uh, a big fishing plant, which they did. Um, they also built the very first research station on Floriana Island, which is just behind uh, Post Office Bay there, um, back in the 1920s. I mean, they, they brought European technology, they brought European um, uh, knowledge to Galapagos. And even though uh, for a lot of things, including illness, 
um, you know, no hospitals on uh, on Galapagos in those days. Uh, it, it, the Norwegian fishing plant eventually stopped, but we still today have descendants of those uh, Norwegian settlers here in the 1920s. And again, you know, between wars, a lot of the uh, the current families come from Belgian, German, Swiss heritage, uh, particularly the Germans, just before Second World War, you know. So they all know why they left. The The reality is, is that it did end up in Galapagos. So Galapagos, through all these stories and books, um, the uniqueness, Melvin and Lienkan Dada's, you know, Darwin by that time had, uh, you know, pretty had, had started to fiddle around with ideas. Science was already looking at Galapagos. And so uh, the Ecuadorian government was looking to really settle Galapagos. So I would say the first significant permanent settlement um, settlements started happening mostly between 1900 and 1940. Yeah. And this sort of brings us to, I guess, our final point or our, our culminative, 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 our big point, our big idea, <laughs> um, which is that with this long heritage of human activity on Galapagos, when, when you and I, again, were having a conversation a couple of weeks ago about what are we going to talk about for this Friday live stream, um, this idea that Galapagos has only been an iconic and world-renowned site for wildlife and wild places conservation for just the last few decades in comparison to hundreds of years of human activity, human presence off and on, and then eventually permanent that have had many effects on the environment around them, the environment, the fragile environment of Galapagos. And I think oftentimes people can lose sight of that and, and lose sight of the fact that conservation as a science, as a set of practices, is still in its own right relatively young it, it, It's in terms of society as a whole, in terms of large scale society. And, but you also mentioned that what GC, what Galapagos Conservancy is doing, as well as other conservation organizations working on the islands and the Ecuadorian government, as well as private citizens and members of the Galapagos community are doing right now to try to preserve, protect, and restore these tortoises, their ecosystems, the different varied spaces and habitats that are on the archipelago, is you know the legacy of hundreds of years of human actions, human actions which were not done necessarily purposely to damage ecosystems, but were simply done in the context of a time in which human beings were simply not considering the ramifications of those sorts of actions. And even if they were, at this point in time, it was more about survival than it was about long-term environmental protection. Um, could you expand on that a little bit, please? Yeah, it's, it is a 500-year legacy that, that the interest in Galapagos had been to extract what we needed but it wasn't just what we took away, it's what we left behind as well. So even right up until, let's say 1959, when the national park, the big national park was declared, um, we were still de dealing pretty much with the same inherited problems. The reduced, uh, well, the heavy impact on animals like the tortoises, the change in the world for everything else that lived on that particular island already existed. And what we left behind is wherever human beings go, there'll be rats. Wherever human beings go, there'll be ants. There's all sorts of things, insects, even viruses, all kinds of things that, um, unless you're really, really acutely aware, are naturally traveling with you wherever you go. And so, I would say probably right up until even 20 years ago, um, we were still dealing with a lot of the inherited issues because the rats that came with the pirates are no different than maybe the rats that showed up in a cargo boat 100 years ago. And so it's in a way it's helped focus conservation in Galapagos, 
because we know what should be here. Um, records like the whalers from Massachusetts have given an idea of what numbers should have been here and where they were, all the different, even anecdotal uh, information. Um, there's a, a family here, uh, the DeRoy family, who collected land snails from from when they arrived, like the 1940s, and uh, they that collection completely changed what we know about the Galapagos endemic land snail. I think we're up to like 160 different types of varieties from one ancestor. So, you know, all these things you put together without tortoises and with the presence of rats, the land snails aren't gonna be able to survive very well either, you know, cause the plants get distributed and introduced an introduced snail like the uh, giant African snail that made it here about 10 years ago, immediately pushes out any other snails at least. And so, I, I would say as a as a summary, we, we are still going to be cleaning up um, what was not done intentionally. Like I said, right up until 20 years ago, we didn't have shops really to speak of here. I used to go to the mainland once a year and stock up on everything that I needed as best as possible. Uh, we didn't have the big physical footprint that we, we do now. Um, and so we're talking from 1535 until probably 1980 or 1990 of the same issues existed. The difference today is we now have the word conservation. Uh, the uh, IUCN that was only created in the 1950s, the UNESCO heritage site was, you know, we were one of the first here in Galapagos was 1979. I mean, we're talking very recent history of changing the paradigm, changing the mindset, not just locally, but globally of the importance of a place like Galapagos. So. Tourism certainly puts a spotlight on the amazing things that are here. But again, that's a fairly recent industry. What we need is to make sure that everybody understands that it's not going to magically fix itself. And that's where groups like Lapa Conservancy comes into it. Um, you need to research what, and this is where James did recently with the tortoises on Santa Fe. You need to research, go through everything you can possibly find to determine were they there, where were they, what's the interaction, everything else. Find a way to get them back there. Um, and then you have to monitor. This is this is the whole premise of what is the catchword these days, but it's been around for a long time, is rewilding. So Galapagos Conservancy and other institutions here in, in the islands that have been working on this for decades have been rewilding, removing the introduced animal usually or introduced pest, whether it's a, an ant or a goat, to allow the numbers of the uh, endemic, threatened endemic species to build up, putting back what's needed. Tortoises can't survive without cactus. So the goats ate the cactus, pulled them down, so now we need to get the cactus back. Getting everything back enough for them to together as a united habitat, as a united ecosystem, start to restore their island. Now, it won't, it's not about turning it back the way it used to be 100 years ago or 200 years ago. It's just rewilding, it's just putting those key elements back on the, uh, where they belong without the threats and letting nature take its course again. So, um, that has been happening for 60, more or less 60 years here in bits and pieces, because it's an expensive journey to try and rebuild an entire archipelago. Um, but it is something that, that can be achieved. And the concept of rewilding, now that it's becoming just as common as saying the word conservation, means that I think our supporters, and uh, in particular, understand this, is we're not trying to make everything perfect. We just want to get what is needs to be there, there, and then nature will do the rest. Absolutely. I have heard rewilding referred to as, as setting the stage for nature yeah. to, to play its part, to, for, the, for the vast grand production that is nature, and especially on Galapagos Archipelago, it is a resilient suite of species and ecosystems that are and have been pushed very hard by human presence and human actions over the last hundreds of years. But as Roz was mentioning, there are a lot of people, a lot of organizations, a lot of people, both internationally and 
um, physically in Galapagos who are part of this initiative to rewild and restore Galapagos. Just speaking for us exclusively, um, the, the, the genetic confirmation of, of, Fernan, of Fernanda from Fernandina Island um, as what we thought was a species that had gone extinct 100, year, 100 or so years ago, now we're working to try to find other individuals of that species to help restore that animal to that area of the habitat. Um, the Santa Fe program that we talked with Dr. Gibbs, which if you have not seen that live stream, I would highly recommend going back in our Facebook and looking at that as well because it has a lot to do with what we've been talking about today, which is the elimination of feral goats and other invasive species and the restoration of that ecosystem engineer to a habitat that has been missing it for a long time. So many of these little projects and little programs, if you go on to Galapagos.org, visit our website and see all of these different things we're involved in, it might seem like they're all varied and disconnected, but ultimately it's what Roz is saying, which is that it's a process. It's a process, it's a process of rewilding these ecosystems that have the capability of being preserved and saved and rewilded and restored, but they just need some help. And that's ultimately where, where we step in. And so real quick, we're almost at the end of our discussion with Roz today. I wanna make sure that you all in the chat, if you're still watching, um, have an opportunity to ask any questions that, that, uh, to Roz or myself. Um, while we're waiting on that, I do want to again mention if you are interested at all in learning more about the um, Galapagos history, the human heritage of Galapagos, Galapagos Revealed by our very own Rosalind Cameron and Randy Moore um, is available on our website, Galapagos.org, in the store. Um, and additionally, if you do want to help at all with the work that is being done to fix and restore the ecosystems of Galapagos from these inherited issues that we talked about for the last 45 minutes or so, um, please visit the link below and, and help us do what we do. Help us enact these projects and programs that are so much about working to handle the complex legacy that is Galapagos archipelago and, and, and human activity there as well. So let me go to the chat and see if there are any questions from, um, from our viewers at home. It looks like I'm not seeing anything. Let me get one more check real quick. Um, Roz, do you have any final comments before I, before I uh, open it up to the chat to say anything else? Yeah, I, I think we need to underscore that just as in the past, the present and the future, mm. Glo it's global politics, it's global economy, and it's global action mm. that is affecting positively and negatively Galapagos. And I, and I don't think we can eliminate um, the amazing work that's going on by, you know, creating a sustainable society in Galapagos, everybody participating. We're probably one of the most heavily regulated places in the world where you're trying to bring either a private boat or operate tourism, etc. But it's all for a very important reason is if we're going to protect a place like Galapagos, you can still have business, you can still live here, you can still have development, but do it consciously. Mm. So that's locally. Globally, climate change, plastics, uh, I mean, they're affecting the whole world. We don't produce more than 1% of the plastic that is collected every week from the beaches of Galapagos and the microplastics are all washing up on our shores. We're not producing that. So I guess my, my call is to literally every single one of us, wherever we are, to, to be aware of our purchase choices, to be aware of supporting groups like Galapagos Conservancy, do stuff in your own backyard, um, but become aware of how these these global decisions can make or break what's happening in a place like Galapagos. And so that must be islands all over the world, uh, but particularly with plastics and particularly with climate change. They're, they're the big ones ahead mm -hmm. and they're affecting the whole planet and their uh, planet. They're definitely affecting us here in Galapagos. Absolutely. It does, has, and will continue to take a global collaborative movement by the global community to save and protect well into the future places like Galapagos. But fragile and unique ecosystems 
all across the globe. I cannot say it any better than Roz just did. It takes, it takes a village, and the village is very big, and it looks like Earth. So if any of you are <laughs> interested in supporting our work at Galapagos Conservancy, again, visit the link below. Um, visit Galapagos.org. Follow us on, on Instagram, Twitter. Um, to keep up with what we, what we do here, we, we get involved in a lot of really interesting products or projects and exciting programs, and um, we'd love for you to be able to get involved in as much as possible, and any generous support that you'd be willing to send our way, we will absolutely make the best use of it, so we appreciate that as well. But, Roz, thank you, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. I know that I learned a lot. I hope that you all at home learned a lot as well. Um, Big shout out to the Galapagos Internet for holding you, uh, holding you into this chat. I appreciate that as well. Tell the whole rest of the town thank you for staying off their phones so that we could talk to you exclusively for the last 45 minutes. Um, but again, thank you so much for your time today, Roz. For those of you viewing at home, thank you so much for tuning in and for your continued support and interest. And I think that's going to about do that. So thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.